Hey guys, welcome to Lifting Linux. In this video, I'm showing off my fully 3D printed version of my custom framework mainboard keyboard enclosure. I'll walk you through the journey from the very first prototype to the final machine, the Lunamum CJ64, and now the publicly available 3D printed version. We'll take a quick look at the build process for the printed enclosure, but the real focus here is on the Linux setup. I'll demonstrate a fresh Arch install and show you how to customize Hyperland to make it truly your own. This one's gonna get a bit nerdy, so buckle up, but stick around for all the details because I'm giving away this one-of-a-kind PC. Now, Project CJ64 is something I started back in 2021, almost as soon as I got my Batch 1 Framework laptop. I just couldn't resist tinkering. If you're not familiar with Framework, they're a company that makes fully user-serviceable, repairable, and upgradable laptops. Every component is modular and you can find replacements or upgrades right on their marketplace. Hinge broken? Replace it. Battery not holding a charge anymore? Grab a new one or upgrade to a higher capacity option. Got your eye on the next gen CPU? Swap in a new main board. I've done that four times now. Yeah, it's a bit excessive, but it also gives me plenty of spare main boards for projects. I've built a custom desktop enclosure that pairs a framework mainboard with a dedicated GPU, a portable cyber deck with a custom GPU dock, and I'm currently working on a six bay NAS enclosure using a framework mainboard. But the project I keep coming back to is my very first one, the CJ64. As the name suggests, this project was inspired by my first computer, the legendary Commodore 64. The CJ64 started as a humble 3D printed prototype that went through several iterations as I fine tuned the design. Once I was happy with it, I sent the CAD plans off and had this beauty made, a fully machine, media blasted and anodized version of the CJ64. It turned out to be a pretty popular project. I'll link the full project playlist below, but here's the catch. It cost about $800 just to machine the enclosure, not exactly practical for the masses. For those interested, the original CAD plans are available to my Patreon members, but I wanted to make this design more accessible, so I went back to the drawing board and redesigned it to be easily 3D printed. The only caveat, you'll need a printer large enough to handle the full size components. Splitting the model and trying to glue the parts together is doable, but isn't really practical. It's just too thin for that. Now, if you're ready to give it a shot, I've uploaded the STLs to printables along with the complete video guide. The guide covers everything you need to know, material considerations, print settings, post-processing, the parts list, installing threaded inserts, adding Wi-Fi, and even power button options. For those without access to a 3D printer, don't worry, there are plenty of online printing services out there. I had this one printed in a tough, heat-resistant resin using PCBWay's print service, and no, they're not a sponsor. I don't do corporate sponsorships, nor is it an endorsement. They just happen to give me the best quote, about 50 bucks with a pretty quick turnaround time. Now, I've showcased the full build process for this keyboard PC over on my main channel. So definitely check that out for all the details. It's a pretty straightforward process, but here's a quick recap. For the heart of this build, I'm using a first gen framework main board with the Intel i5 1135G7 processor. It's securely screwed into the lower enclosure and I've installed 16 gigabytes of DDR4 3200 memory and a 500 gigabit crucial P3 SSD and an Intel AX210 Wi-Fi adapter to round it out. The keyboard is where things get fun. I'm using the BM60 Poker Hot Swap 60% PCB from KB Republic in a 61K layout paired with an anodized aluminum positioning tray and Duroc V3 stabilizers. The switches are Duroc Silent T1 tactiles, which I originally topped with the MT3 Noctua keycap set from Drop. However, the colors just clashed with the black keyboard and I wasn't able to find a complementary enclosure color for the Noctua colorway. So 
I temporarily swapped out the keycaps while I wait on a new MT3 white on black set to arrive. The entire theme here is stealth, quiet and understated. To most people, it just looks like a mechanical keyboard, completely unaware this is the actual computer. That stealthy vibe carries to the rest of the setup, keeping it minimalist. A 32 inch 1440p 144Hz monitor, a photo arc ergonomic vertical mouse, and a Bose Soundlick Flex. And that's it. A clean, simple, stealthy workstation. To keep things running cool and quiet, I tune the main board by limiting the turbo boost settings in the UFAI preventing the 11th gen Intel chip from hitting its 60 watt peak. Running the fan at full speed all the time would completely ruin the stealth aesthetic, not to mention that the main board is encased in a 3D printed plastic shell. While the PETG material should handle the heat just fine for regular use, I do have the heat resistant resin version on standby if I want to push things farther with my higher end Ryzen 7040 series main board. Now, I know you're looking at a Windows 11 OS at the moment, but let's dive into the plans for the operating system and desktop. What I'm about to show you is a bit more advanced than the kind of content I typically plan to create for this channel. My goal here and for the channel overall is to do my small part in making the world of Linux, open source, and free software more approachable and digestible. My intended audience for the channel are all Linux users, but with a focus on the Linux beginner, novices, or even just the Linux curious. My content will focus on both hardware and software. For example, in my first video, I explored how Linux performs on an affordable mini PC, highlighting the challenges and benefits of using Linux on bleeding edge hardware. In my next video, I'll build the ultimate budget-friendly Linux desktop and then use it to introduce viewers to the many options available in Linux operating systems and desktops environments in future videos. But what I'm presenting today is a little different. I'll be installing Arch Linux, a fantastic operating system, but not one I'd recommend to anyone just starting their Linux journey. And instead of a familiar desktop environment like KDE, Cinnamon, or GNOME, I'll be setting up Hyperland, a tiling window manager. So what's a tiling window manager? Well, it's a lightweight, highly customizable tool that organizes your screen into a tiled layout where windows don't overlap, making full use of your screen space. Unlike traditional desktops where you drag and resize windows with a mouse, tiling window managers prioritize efficiency through keyboard shortcuts. They're perfect for users who want a fast, distraction-free workflow without relying on a mouse all the time. And Honestly, how could I not use Hyperland on a keyboard PC? Now, this video isn't necessarily a beginner-friendly tutorial. It's more of a showcase of what's possible in the Linux world. I want to demonstrate the kind of flexibility and creativity that just isn't even conceivable on Windows or Mac. So, let's get started. To get started, I grabbed the latest Arch Linux ISO and copied it to my Ventoy USB drive, conveniently installed on a framework storage expansion card that slides seamlessly into the CJ64's built-in expansion bays. Once I power the system on, Ventoy launches, and I can select the Arch ISO to boot into the Arch live environment. This is one of the reasons I wouldn't recommend Arch to beginners. Instead of being greeted by a user-friendly desktop like in most distros live environments, I'm met with a stark command line interface, and the only way forward is by typing commands. While Arch includes an installer script, I need to be online to use it, and if I ping a server, I can see that I am offline, so I have to use a CLI tool to connect to my Wi-Fi. For those who want complete control over the systems, a manual Arch install from scratch is an option, but for this setup I'm using the Arch install script. Since this isn't a tutorial, I'll quickly move through the steps, highlighting a couple of details. First, I select the desktop option for running Arch. If you have some Linux experience and want to try a Windows manager like Hyperland, I recommend installing a familiar desktop environment like KDE alongside Hyperland. That way you have a fallback if something breaks. For this setup though, I'm jumping straight into Hyperland. 
I also copy over my Wi-Fi configuration and let the installer do its thing. After the installation, I reboot the system. There was a minor resolution issue with my capture card on the login screen, but I selected the Hyperlint session and logged in. And here we are, Hyperlint is up and running and as you see, the desktop is minimal. No status bar, no doc, just a background and a warning message. Thankfully, the warning provides useful information like the location of the hyperlink configuration file and the key binding for opening the terminal. Pressing super plus Q launches the kitty terminal, giving me access to the command line. Technically, the system is fully functional at this point, but I need to configure it further to make it practical. Let's open the hyperlink configuration file, hyperland.conf, which controls everything, the compositor's behavior, Windows management, and the look and feel of the desktop. I've already configured the display output here for my capture card, and I can quickly adjust the scaling to make things easier to see on video. Now, since this CJ64 uses a 61 key layout without traditional arrow keys, rather they're mapped instead to function plus the WASD, I'll switch the focus movement keys to the more familiar Vim style HJKL setup. Finally, I can deactivate the warning message, write out the file, and immediately see the changes take effect. Super R brings up my app menu, and I can demonstrate windows tiling by launching multiple kitties. Each new window carves out its space on the desktop in a tiled layout. Using my customized key bindings, I can easily switch between the windows, move them to different desktops, rearrange them, and close them all without touching a mouse. And while a terminal-only approach is fine for the ultra-minimalist or text-mode enthusiast, most of us don't operate exclusively on a console. That's where Hyperlint shines. It focuses on performance, flexibility, and aesthetics, making it an excellent choice for users who want a highly customizable and visually appealing desktop environment. From the terminal, I can begin to build out and customize the desktop exactly how I want it. I can install a status bar, build out the AUR helper, and configure every piece of the system to suit my workflow. Of course, we definitely don't have time for all of that today, but if you're interested in building a Hyperlint interface from scratch, Typecraft has an excellent series that walks you through the process step by step. I'll leave a link to their channel below. Now, if I install Firefox, Super R to open the app menu and then launch the browser, I can head over to Unix Porn to check out some spicy desktops. Unix Porn is a subreddit where Linux users share their customized setups, showcasing the incredible variety and creativity within the community. What's more, many users generously share their dot files, the configuration files you can download to replicate their themes. It's a treasure trove of inspiration from minimalist design to wildly intricate layouts, and it's proof of how flexible and fun Linux customization can be. But for time's sake and to show you what is possible with a tiling window manager, I'm gonna install my Linux for Works Hyperlint configuration. I'll also leave a link to his full video on this setup. It's pretty simple. Copy and paste and run through the installation script. After tweaking the resolution for my capture card, I log into a beautifully customized desktop. This configuration includes a welcome card with essential key bindings, a way bar for shortcuts and status indicators, and a sidebar menu for desktop controls. The Hyperlint configuration becomes modular with the main Hyperlint comp file linking to sub configuration files for easier management. For example, key binding changes are made in the key bindings comp file. A standout feature of this setup is its dynamic theming. Changing the wallpaper automatically updates the entire color scheme, status bar, terminal, and all. It's sleek and cohesive. Despite these customizations, the fundamental functionality of Hyperland remains intact. I can still navigate, launch programs, switch desktops, and manage windows effortlessly with the keyboard or a mouse if I prefer. And that's it guys, 
Arch Linux with a tiling window manager is definitely for a very particular type of advanced user. To be honest, I've been a Linux user for almost 30 years and I still gravitate towards familiar desktop environments like KDE or GNOME. But that's the beauty of Linux. It showcases just how open and customizable the environment can be. It's about finding out what works best for you. And in this case, Hyperlin turned out to be a perfect fit for this one of a kind PC. Now, over on my main channel, I'm giving away a bunch of these printed CJ64 enclosures, but for y'all here, I might actually be giving away this fully built complete CJ64, including the framework mainboard, keyboard, and one USB-C expansion card. And the winner will have to go over to the framework marketplace and customize the other two expansion cards to fit their needs. But why might, well, I'll be giving it away once this channel hits 5,000 subscribers. Now, I can't technically offer an incentive to subscribe, only the big YouTubers seem to get away with that. But let's just say if I hit 5,000 subs, I'll celebrate by giving away this custom computer. If you want a chance to win, all you have to do is leave a comment below letting me know what Linux distro and desktop environment you'd install on it. You know, if you're not ready to dive into the Hyperland Arch setup that's on it now. And that's it guys. From the design and build process to the Arch Linux install with Hyperland, the CJ64 is my tiny testament to how far you can push creativity and customization in the tech world. If you enjoyed this project and want to see more like it, hit that like button and consider subscribing. Of course, don't forget to drop a comment below to enter the giveaway and let me know what Linux distro and DE you'd run on this unique setup. I can't wait to hear your ideas. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.